something that was practical for our class and kind of bring in what you've been hearing on Sunday mornings and some of that. And I wanted to preach to you or teach to you technically on how the gospel affects our decisions. Well, then when I went back and I looked at what chapter we were on in the book of Romans, um, we're already there. And so for those of you who have been joining us uh, for this is your first time in a while, we've been walking through the book of Romans. Our uh, theme this year is the gospel for our city. And so what we've been doing is we've been walking through the book of Romans and trying to understand what God has done for us and how it affects the rest of our lives. And so when we say the gospel for our city, obviously that is outreach oriented. But one of the examples that I use all the time, and Dylan, you'll appreciate this, but like it doesn't matter how much you pay me to fly Dylan's plane, I'm not going to do it because I don't know how. I don't know all of the instruments, I don't know how it works, I don't know all of the concepts, I don't know all the principles. And we can talk about taking the gospel to someone as much as we want. But until it is something that we have personally learned and been affected by, we won't do it. And so as we've walked through this book, as we've looked at Romans, the book of Romans is written with the power of the gospel in mind. This is what God has done for you. This is how Jesus should have changed your life. And this is how it can flow out of you. And so Romans 14 is often used as the passage for developing a biblical view of standards. Here's what I want you to do, okay? We're not talking about standards today, okay? So all of you that are like, oh man, some of you are like, oh man, some of you are like, oh, thank God, okay? That's not what we're talking about. What we are talking about today is living the Christian life the way that God wants us to, okay? Standards right now is a big topic of conversation with young adults. It's either that, well, we're too legalistic or there's too much liberty or there's no freedom or there's this or there's that. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to come to the book of, to the chapter of Romans 14. And I want you to come to it with this thought in mind. How does God want me to live? And what should I do based off of what he's done for me? And so I want us to, I want to teach to you today, and I've entitled the lesson very simply. This is, like I said, lesson 23. The gospel determines how we live. Okay? Nowhere in Romans 14 does Paul say, all right, you need to develop your list of standards. You need to make sure that you do this. Don't do that. He gives us a way of thinking of how to live. And sometimes what we miss biblically in today's society, and specifically in this generation, is that very rarely does the Bible say you need to, there's a lot of gray areas. Let's just say it like that. Okay, very rarely does the Bible speak to things in 2023 and it says you can watch this on Netflix, but you can't watch this on Netflix. You can have Netflix, but you can't have Hulu. You can have Hulu, but you can't. You can have Pure Flix, but you can't have, okay? That's not how the Bible works, all right? And some of us, that's what we want. Like, well, just give me the rules and I'll, I'll obey them. Or for the rest of you, just give me the rules and I'll not obey them, all right? But sometimes that's what we want. And what the Bible often does, especially the New Testament, is it says, here's the boundary, here's the lens, here's the way that we should be thinking, and then take those principles and apply them to Netflix, to your workplace, to whatever it may be. And so Romans 14 is exactly that. I know it's a lengthy passage, but I want us to read it. And um, well, I'll, I'll skip a couple of verses, but let's begin reading in verse number one. It says, him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge, or eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant to his own master? He standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So let's stop for just a second, okay? Let's remind ourselves of the context of the book of Romans. This is as the Jews are trying to reintegrate back into Rome. They're trying to reintegrate back into the church of Rome. And so as Paul is writing this, he's writing it to Jews and Gentiles, all right? 
So what he's saying is, and it's most likely in reference to the Jews, because the Jews have a ton of things that they celebrate. He says there may be someone who has all of these days that they esteem better than some than another. Okay, the day of Pentecost, the Jews are going to celebrate that. The feast of Passover, they're going to celebrate that. They have all these days that they are going to elevate. And there's all these Gentiles in the Church of Rome that are like. Every day is just the same. Like we don't have, we don't have that. Okay, we don't have the things that we sell. We don't have Patriotic Sunday. We don't have uh, Christmas Sunday. We don't have, we don't have all those things. So what? And what he's saying is, stop trying to split hairs and say, well, you think this day is important, and I don't care whether this day is important. And so he's using that. He uses food. He uses the way that he eats. And then he says in verse number six, or verse number five. I want you to see this. He says, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks, and, but he, and he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I want you to skip down and if you would look with me at verse number uh, 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that is, er, for he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of them. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and the things wherewith one may edify one another. For meat, destroy not the work of God. I want us to pray, and here's what I want to ask you to do, okay? If you'll give me just a couple minutes. I know what time it is. I give me 15 minutes, and here's what I want you to do. Maybe pull out your phone. I think this is important enough. I love using the notes in my phone for really important things. Like one of them is golf reminders. Okay, so like that's really important to me. So I have things that I want to do when I go on the golf course. But for the rest of the other important things, I like to use my phone to put some spiritual thoughts in. And I think this is important enough for you to hang on. Maybe write into the margin of your Bible. And here's what I want you to do. I have in my Bible in Romans chapter number 14, a biblical view of standards is at the top of that chapter. And what I want you to, to walk with me through is really more importantly than a standard or a, or a rule or a policy or whatever you want to say. This is God's way of teaching us how to make decisions in our lives. This is God's way of helping us understand what we should and should not do. I could probably go through and I could find you a hundred reasons for certain things that you should not do. But the truth is, is if I give them to you, I'm just giving you a set of rules to live by. But if I can give you principles to where when you turn something on your television, when you spend time with someone on a date, when whatever it may be, you can have a lens, you can have a paradigm to say, this is how I'm going to handle this situation. And I think that is much more important than giving you a handout of saying, this is the hundred do's and don'ts of the Christian life, okay? We probably could come up with a thousand in today's society. But more importantly than that, is let's develop a way of thinking about what we should and should not do that is based off of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And so we'll walk you through these five thoughts and then we'll be done. But let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Dear Heavenly Father God, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we walk through this to recall what you have done for us. Lord, living a holy life does not make sense unless we understand how much you have loved us and how holy you are. And so God, I ask you to help us today to not walk out of here with more things that we should or should not do, but Lord, that we would understand why we do it and we would develop a biblical way of thinking about what we do so that we can make good choices in our life. In your name we pray. Amen. Sometimes one of the things that Christians are good at 
is that we are good at finding fault in the rest of the world, all right? How many of you have recognized that about Christians and me? Okay, just one of you. Chandler, thank you for participating, all right? You're not cold. But we're good at finding fault in everybody else. And so let's see if you can walk with me through a little bit of this thought process and see if you've ever seen it either in your own life or in someone else's life, okay? When we look at the world, we are really good at going and finding the people who are marching in the streets and burning down buildings and, and basically promoting ideas and philosophies that we don't agree with. And so what we do as Christians is if the world is over here and Jesus and the cross and salvation is over here, we look at them and we're like, well, goodness gracious, I am not one of them. Like, I am so thankful that I am not that, okay? I'm so thankful that I, I, I don't believe some of those idiotic things that people believe. Like, I can't believe that someone be, would believe in transgenderism. I can't believe that someone would believe in homosexuality. I can't believe that someone would believe in abortion. Like, they're idiots. And so we look at everything that is wrong. And then here in the middle stands the cross of Jesus Christ. But here's what I want you to see. Much of what the world chooses to do and chooses to believe is based off of what they want to, how they want to be seen. Okay, so you have someone over here who they enjoy that they live the party life. They do whatever they want. They're involved in drugs. They're involved in alcohol. They're involved in promiscuity. They're involved in some sort of adulterous, wicked lifestyle. And we look at them. We're like, oh my goodness, they are awful. And please watch this. Okay, if the cross of Jesus Christ is obviously separate from the world. Okay, Christians don't look like that. They don't talk like that. They don't act like that. Sometimes what we do, I want to show you the extremes of both sides. Sometimes what we are guilty of doing is we are guilty of coming over here and developing a way of living that is just as much about being seen as what the world is, okay? So what we do is we say, well, look at how my hair is cut. Look at how I carry my Bible. Look at what I listen to. Look at what I watch, and please watch this. Over here is where liberty and freedom and sin and wickedness comes from, but just as much on the other side of the cross, this is where pride and Phariseeism and all of the things that the world throws stones at, this is where this comes from, okay? There is a ditch on both sides of the road, and what I want you to see from Romans chapter number 14 today is when Jesus drives the change in our lives, it makes sense. In fact, it is attractive to both the wicked of the world and the prideful of the church. I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life where I've been around a Christian or a pastor or a child of God where I have gotten so consumed with, well, look at what I do, and it's been more about look at Joel, and I'm around someone who says, no, look at what I do so that Jesus can be seen in my life, and it becomes attractive to me. And the world looks, and many times what we are good at is we want to promote that to the world and like, well, look at what I have over here. And all the world is seeing is, well, no, you just don't do this and you don't do that. And so you're just missing out on the fun of the world. When Jesus and living the way that he has called us to brings joy. And this is what is attractive to the world. Okay. Both of these may look similar. But when Jesus drives our change in the way that we live, it makes sense. Are you guys tracking? Okay, is everybody following? Yeah. Because here's what I want you to understand. When Jesus saves you, he doesn't save you to stay the same. But he does save you so that he can change you and make him look good, not you look good. If the point of all that you do in the Christian life is so that you can be seen of men and say, well, look at all the boxes that I check, you have missed the point. But if what you do makes Jesus look good, that is the goal of change. And so what I want to give you is I want to give you just quickly five thoughts, okay? Five thoughts about how to develop these decisions and, based on these things in your life. First of all, understand that there are weaker Christians, okay? Understand that there are weaker Christians. In verse number one, he says, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye. Okay? So he says, if you are a child of God, if you are a part of the church, there are weaker Christians. Okay? If you ever go to the gym or you go work out or you go whatever, one of the things that you will notice is this. Is that a good gym, a good physical fitness location, facility, is going to be excited about weaker people being in there. Why? 
Because what they understand is there is a pathway to health and it doesn't matter if you're 350 pounds or you're 175 pounds of lean muscle. They are excited that someone is making a decision toward better health, right? No one's gonna walk in and say, <laughs> look at the fat guy on the elliptical. Okay, that's not a good gym. The fat guy's not going to come back, right? That's not how it should work. And sometimes as Christians, what we do is we just think, well, everybody should be right where I'm at. Like, hey, get with it. Get your hair cut. Get your Bible under your arm. Get the earrings out of your ear. Look like me. Talk like me. Act like me. And what we fail to understand is that the Holy Spirit is the one who does the work. The Holy Spirit is the one who leads change. And the same way that when you walk into a physical fitness location and you say, oh my goodness, I'm so excited this person who has lived an unhealthy lifestyle is deciding to get their health under control. I'm going to encourage them in that when you walk into the church of the living God and you see someone who doesn't look like you, talk like you, act like you, it's not a chance for you to say, look how much better I am than them. It's a chance for you to come alongside of them and say, let me help you find how the Holy Spirit can change your life. Because what we have to understand is this, is if there is joy in following Jesus, we should want to get that person to follow Jesus as quickly as they can. Let's get the sin out of your life. Let's get the alcohol out of your life. Let's get these certain things out of your life so that you can experience the joy of just following Jesus. So we have to understand that there are weaker Christians, and so that should play a part in our decision-making process. But then secondly, allow the Lord to lead your decisions. Allow the Lord to lead your decisions. I want you to see this. He says in verse number six, he that regardeth the day regardeth it not unto the Lord. So here's what he's saying. He says, if you are celebrating the day of Pentecost, he says, guess what? You're doing that unto the Lord. But then I want you to see at the next part of this verse, he says, he that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day, he who doesn't care that it's the day of Pentecost, he basically says, he doesn't care for the Lord. He's doing the same thing. He says, he regardeth it not, to, or, and he says, to the, to the Lord, doth he not regard it. Okay? So here's what he's saying. If you're doing something and you're doing it for the Lord, the person who's not doing that should stand there and clap because look at what this person's doing for the Lord. And the person who's not doing it, if they're doing it for the Lord, should stand there and clap and say, wow, they're not doing it because it doesn't matter to them. Let's give a very practical illustration of this, okay? For years in Christianity, it was this big thing where preachers would stand up and say, bless God, I don't even have a TV in my house. I don't want that Hollywood smut. And so then it became a thing, well, if he doesn't have a TV in, my, in his house, I probably shouldn't have a TV in my house, okay? Well, I don't even have cable TV because cable TV, I don't want that smut being piped into my house, okay? And so everybody stopped having TVs, but watch this. If someone has a TV, and they control it, and they set no wicked thing before their eye for the Lord, there's no difference than the person who doesn't have a TV and says they don't want that smut coming in their life and they're into their house, and they do it for the Lord, there's no difference. And what we have to step back and understand is that what you do, if it is led of the Lord, is just as good as if someone doesn't do it if it is led of the Lord. Now, I'm not talking about doctrinal things. I'm talking about practical things. I'm talking about cultural things, okay? If someone doesn't have Netflix and they say, you know what, I just don't want to be involved in that. I just don't want that smut being, being on my TV. But then you have Netflix, but you control it and you don't watch wickedness on it. There is no difference. As long as the Lord is leading the decision is what matters, okay? So allow the Lord to lead your decisions. And then thirdly, Remember eternity. This is one of my favorite parts. He says in verse number 10, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So here's what I want you to do, okay? I want you to follow me for just a second, these three points so far. I said, understand that there are weaker Christians, which means that you should look around and say, there are people around me that I should probably make a decision so that they don't fall, okay? He says, don't be a stumbling block. But the second thing that I gave you, the way that some Christians respond is they say, sweet, I'm just gonna go live the party lifestyle, but I'm doing it for the Lord, okay? 
Like, I'm just going to go do what I'm just going to go watch whatever. I want. But but Brother Joel said, he that regardeth it not, regardeth it not to the Lord. So I'm just going to regard it not that I go to the bars and live however I want. Okay. But here's the, here's the kicker. Okay. If I can almost give you the hook, let me set that. I got some of you. All right. So now let me set it and take it for just a second. All right. He says, why do you set your brother at naught? Basically say, well, he's a loser because he does this. When each and every one of us will stand before Jesus Christ in eternity. And so here's what I want to ask you, okay? The things that you have given yourself permission to do, will they matter in eternity? The things that you have restricted yourself and that you take pride in, Will it matter in eternity? <laughs> Sometimes when I talk to my son Braxton, we, we talk about sports a lot. And like almost every day after I coach him, like we, I mean, me and him walk out to the car and it's just back and forth. I'm like, Braxton, what in the sink were you doing? Like, what? And he's like, dad, you're being too hard. I'm like the other day in the middle of a game, he looks at me and he's like, you're being a coach and not being a dad. And I was like, yeah, my shirt says coach. So yeah, you're right. All right. I will wear my dad's shirt after the game because right now you're stinking it up. Okay. He responded very well to that and scored two more goals, all right? But I <laughs> think he sticked at me the rest of the game, all right? But what we often talk about is I just eventually get to the point to where it's like, all right, if you don't want to be a good soccer player, I don't care. I'm about to spiritualize the stink out of this. And I'm going to look at him and say, Braxton, does this matter in light of eternity, okay? And does my argument matter in light of eternity? Probably not either. So the coin can come back to me as well, okay? But what we miss so many times in the Christian life is this. We make a big deal out of what we do, or we make a big deal about what we're allowed to do, and what we miss is this. One of these days when we stand before Jesus Christ, he's going to look at us and he's going to say, what did you do for me? What did you do that mattered in eternity? In, in eternity? I don't think we're going to get to heaven and God is going to hand out crowns or awards. Like, you were the most liberated Christian. You got to enjoy the freedom of the Christian life the most. And so here you go. Here's your crown for enjoying your liberty. But then on the other hand, he's not going to go, oh, you checked all the boxes. Here's your crown for being the strictest Christian. What he's going to say is he's going to say, you have to give an account for what I have called you to do. You must give an account for what matters in eternity. And then fourthly is this. Look at the effect of your decisions or of whatever, your liberty, your freedom, your pride. Look at the effect on others. Look at the effect on others. <laughs> Which means this. He says that you can be a stumbling block in verse number 13. I hate the argument in Christianity that says, well, I just don't care what others think about me. That is the sign of an immature Christian, okay? Because basically what we're saying is, I'm not going to change things in my life that God needs me to change because I don't care what others think about me. I've made this statement a hundred times in this class. If someone has to trip over you to get to Jesus, you're the one who's made the mistake. If they look at your life and they say, well, that person's a Christian, but look at the language that they use. Well, that person's a Christian, but look at the way that they live their life. That person's a Christian, but look at their attitude. Look at how much peace they lack. Look at how much joy they lack. Look at your effect on others. And then lastly, remember what matters to God. I want you to see verse number 20 because I have a highlighted, underlined, and everything that I can do in, in my Bible. But it says, for meat destroy not the work of God. And here's what he closes this chapter with. He uses all of these shallow examples. He says, some of you will eat meat. Some of you will eat herbs. Some of you will be excited when a certain day comes. Some of you won't care that a certain day comes. But then he closes with this. He says, peace, righteousness, and joy is what matters to me. What matters to God is that we live righteously. What matters to God is that we enjoy peace. What matters to God is that we be unified in the Christian life. That's what matters to God. And so what he closes with, it's almost like he sets them up and he says, some of you eat meat, some of you eat herbs, some of you are excited about a day, some of you don't care about a day. But here's what you need to remember, is for meat, why are you going to destroy the work of God? And so let's make that practical to us in 2023. 
for your liberty, why are you going to destroy God's work? For your Phariseeism, your pride, why are you going to destroy God's work? You know what? I, I get so excited when I, see a, when I see a Christian who has enjoyed liberty over here and they get to this point where they're like, you know what? Biblically, I could drink, but I don't have to because Jesus is my joy. Biblically, I tell Braxton all the time, I was like, based off of the New Testament, I'm like, biblically, I could kill someone and go to heaven. So if we're really like enjoying our liberty as a Christian, then do whatever you want. But you know what Jesus wants us to understand is because of what I have done for you, because of what Jesus has done for us, why are you going to settle for the joy of this world when you can have me? On the other side of that coin, why are you going to settle for making yourself look good when you can make Jesus look good? And here's what I here's my heart for you today. I love seeing the Christians who just say, Jesus is going to guide my decisions. I'm going to do some things, not because I even necessarily agree or disagree with them. I'm going to do them because someone else's life matters. I'm going to do them because righteousness matters to God. And the truth is, is I don't need Netflix to make me happy. I don't need this to make me happy. Jesus is all that I need to make me happy. And what I want you to see is that there are extremes on either side. But the joy is found as we simply follow Jesus and look at what he's done for us. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, we'll pray. We'll be done. Dear Heavenly Father.